Before you go ahead and skip that ad, you should know that this month, from October 31st through November 30th, 2021, 100% 100 of proceeds from this channel will be donated to To Write Love on Her Arms, a nonprofit organization that helps with treatment for addiction, depression, and other diseases. Because everything from ads to Patreon funding is community funded here, um, that does mean I'd just like to thank you for that donation. Now on to that video. In Buddhist tradition, there are many worlds which are not visible to our eyes. Gods and the enlightened live above our earth, while troubled and forgotten beings lurk in the shadows below. The greatest earthly pleasures pale in comparison to those of the heavens, while the worst earthly suffering cannot come close to matching that of the most hellish realms. Yet, unlike many other traditions, Buddhism tells that beings move between these realms in their many incarnations. One of these realms is that of the hungry ghosts. This realm is said to be one level below ours, marked by the suffering of the beings who inhabit it. These ghosts hunger for something to sustain them, but any food they take in either turns to fire or is coughed back up. Unable to find what they need, the ghosts roam the earth, searching. But incarnation as a hungry ghost is not a permanent hell. Even in the darkness, there is hope, as we can see in the story of one monk who visited the realm and escaped to tell the tale. My name is Sean. Welcome to Mythos and Logos. Existence as a hungry ghost is defined by insatiable desire. The shadowy creature is recognized by its huge stomach, the outward sign of an unyielding appetite. But the rest of the ghost's form is quite the opposite disturbingly thin and weak, betraying the fact that its stomach is entirely empty. For some ghosts, food transforms into dirt or flame at their touch. Others have thin necks or closed mouths, allowing nothing to pass through. Ghosts will fight each other over even a single grain of rice, aching for a moment's relief from the pain of hunger. Life for these ghosts is desperate. It's no coincidence that the addiction specialist, Dr. Gabor Mate, uses hungry ghost imagery to describe the lives of many of his patients. This is the domain of addiction, where we constantly seek something outside ourselves to curb an insatiable yearning for relief or fulfillment. The aching emptiness is perpetual because the substances, objects, or pursuits we hope will soothe it are not what we really need. We don't know what we need, and as long as we stay in the hungry ghost mode, we'll never know. We haunt our lives without being fully present. Just as those whose minds are ruled by dependency are not fully present, the ghosts are not fully here, yet not detached from this earth either. The hungry ghosts exist at the margins of our world, invisible to all but a gifted few. A poem in the Pali Canon of Buddhist scripture tells of ghosts who dwell outside city walls, who watch the living inside feast, but forgotten are unable to share in their meals. Other stories describe ghosts with an endless thirst, inhabiting riversides, only able to drink the mud kicked up by the shoes of those passing by. But rather than fear these ghosts, humans typically pity them. Moved by their suffering, there are many stories of humans' efforts to save the hungry ghosts. But the most well-known of these is that of one of the Buddha's disciples, 
who descends into the realm of the ghosts with a mission to save them. Of all the Buddha's disciples, Margalyayana is said to have been one of the most remarkable. Born into an upper-class family of intellectuals, Margalyayana was a gifted scholar in his own right, hand-picked to teach the Buddha's son. But this story focuses on one of the disciples' more mystical gifts, his legendary ability to see the dead. During one particularly deep meditation, the monk leaves our world and approaches a hellish realm which exists in its shadows. This is the realm of the hungry ghosts, where Madgalyayana sees beings suffering, each in a way specific to the life they lived. Yet, of all the suffering ghosts, Madgalyayana is drawn to one, thin, skin and bones, but strangely familiar. His heart breaks when he recognizes this suffering ghost as his mother. Remembering how his mother cared for and fed him, Madgalyayana tries to ease her suffering. But as scripture tells, this does not go as planned. Stricken with grief, Madgalyayana filled a bowl with rice and approached his mother to offer it. His mother held the bowl in her left hand and took some rice with her right hand, but before the rice reached her mouth, it turned into a piece of burning charcoal, and she could not eat it at all. Crying loudly in anguish, Madgalyayana hurriedly returned to the presence of the Buddha and related to him in detail. What had happened. Madgalyayana, used to being spiritually gifted, weeps to the Buddha, asking why he is unable to help his own mother. The Buddha explains that, though he is able to see into the hungry ghost realm, it is with clouded vision. Madgalyayana is attached to his mother as he once knew her the way that a young child cannot see their parents' flaws. Though the specifics vary with each telling, it turns out that the disciple's mother is still attached to the possessions or status that she once held in her past life. The Buddha tells Madgalyayana that his mother made her own choices, choices which led her to become a hungry ghost. This is why, as a ghost, she hungers for something that she cannot eat, because what she seeks will not truly sustain her. He must accept that, and accept that no one, not even someone with psychic powers, can end another's addiction on their own. The Buddha tells Madgalyayana that what is needed to end his mother's hunger is a community effort for good karma. It is important to understand karma not as some point system, but rather as an interwoven relationship of cause and effect. The goal, then, is to cause a break from the vicious cycles of suffering which define the ghosts' lives. The Buddha tells Madgalyayana to gather food and offer it as a gift to the community of monks who depend on donations to live. Madgalyayana gives the donation in his mother's name, and in turn, the monks pray for her. Just as the donor and the monks are connected, each helping each other, we are asked to understand all beings. As we influence and are influenced by those around us like a complex knot, A good action on one end pulls all of the others along. This is how Madgalyayana's action reaches even his mother, breaking the vicious cycle of bad karma and giving her the opportunity to make a change. 
Magdalena's gift marks the first occasion of the Hungry Ghost Festival, held yearly across Asia and the world, in which offerings are made on behalf of those who have passed. The laity offers food for the monks in the name of the departed, and in turn the monks work to ensure that the dead are remembered and honored. Many offerings are made directly to the ghosts as well, such as burning offerings of play money or holding performances with the front row open for any hungry ghosts who may be attending. And it is, of course, the living who make these sacrifices. So the purpose is twofold. By offering good karma to the departed, we can also better train ourselves to let go of our attachments. By helping the hungry ghosts, we stop ourselves from becoming them. Whether or not one has Mount Galyayana's psychic talents, we can all see the hungry ghosts around us. Often this suffering stems from society's failures and seems too deeply embedded to change. Yet in even some of the most seemingly privileged communities, addiction and suffering are widespread. In either case, the Buddhist understanding of karma provides the first step to a remedy. Seeing that our lives are connected inspires hope against even seemingly impossible odds, as even the smallest action, as part of a chain, makes a difference. The hungry ghost in each of us comes out when we are trapped in cycles, whether they be the feedback loops of addiction, or generations of trauma, or the mental traps of depression. These cycles are not easy to escape, and ultimately, only the one suffering can make the choice to leave. But our connected nature means that even the smallest act of goodness can be an opportunity to end the cycle. Like a scene in which the Buddha cures the ghost's thirst before teaching them what it is they're really seeking, the smallest act of love, compassion, or even recognizing basic human dignity in another can be the first step in helping them and us to find what we really need.